Jim, welcome back to Edinburgh. You brought the beautiful weather with you. But, it's nice um, to be here. Yeah, thank you for having me well, Thank you for coming back to the Age of Scotland Institute, where you were, if not our first, one of the very earliest speakers when we launched this institute five years ago. And I remember saying, when we launched the uh, event um, at the University of Edinburgh, that we were going to get people to come up and talk about um, pro on programmes that would educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders about Asia. And a rather doer man in the front row said, well, Mr. Gow, he said, what makes you think you'll ever get anybody of any significance to come and speak here? So, thank you for coming back. Very flattering um, of you. Good. Well, thanks. Um, you're going to be talking later on this evening over in Glasgow about uh, the new global economy, something which I know you've, you've talked about and written about with the acronyms that you've created, BRICS and MINT and others. Um, but we live in an, seem to live in an extraordinary time with Trump in the States, emerging nationalism potentially in other countries, TPP not being signed, and yet the Prime Premier of, of, of China talking at Davos about the importance of globalisation. How do you see the markets, um, particularly worldwide and within that, Asia's role? Nice easy question to start, Roddy. There you go. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's, a, it's a huge honour. Um, let me try to be as simple as possible, as I often try, maybe because I, 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 I can't get more complex. Um, you know, on one level, and it's quite a big part of me that believes this, mm. that I think there's a lot of noise that goes on more than it did. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of what people talk about in terms of all this uncertainty, some of which you touched on because of certain political events. Yeah. It's sort of presented to us as being a new thing. And this is particularly important, for, I think, for your young supporters mm -hmm. and future leaders to get their minds around. I don't think it's really new. No. The world is always uncertain. Mm. What, what's new is because of, uh, in my opinion, 24-7 information, we get fed things all day long mm -hmm. from any part of the world and nothing's a secret. Yeah. And so the, the knowledge that the world is uncertain is new, but it doesn't mean to say it's actually genuinely more uncertain. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout you and my lives, yeah. Yeah. there's been you know, all sorts of things happen that you wouldn't have thought about. Yeah. And we, we kind of got through it. So there's my first thing. Right. The second thing, coming to the core part of your question, is despite all of these things, and we can get into any of them. I think the, the biggest thing going on in the world, which is why your bold idea of five years ago is so smart, mm -hmm. is the ongoing rise of Asia. In yeah. particular, the remarkable uh, ongoing, uh, albeit complex, rise of China. And whilst never quite as eye-catching, the similarly uh, ongoing rise of India. Yeah. Which, in fact, if China, if China didn't exist as a story, India. The Indian thing would, yeah, be, would be a big thing. But I think the rise of China and India uh, continue to be the most important things to think about in terms of the world economy. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, in many other aspects that go with that, socially and culturally and yeah. maybe otherwise as well. Sitting here in, in Edinburgh, <coughs> not in the UK, it, it's it seemed to me that in both China and in India, which you mentioned, uh, we're, we're not where some of the other major European countries no. are at all. No. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Why have we moved so slowly and so ineffectively? Oh, gosh. I wish I knew the exact answer to that because I would have managed to put it in a nice little box and either personally benefited from it financially better than the luck that I've had, which has been a great deal of luck financially in my life, mm. or done something else with it. I, um, I don't know, but it's true. Mm. I, I, I suspect... There are three elements. Uh, firstly, we have a slightly empire-esque mm -hmm. view of the world still. Yeah. That, you know, all these things go on all over the place and go on around us. But at the end of the day, the Brits know best and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. uh, which actually, I think, causes us some dilemmas with some of these countries. I think it's an issue of the two I've mentioned so far, but in Asia. I think it's a big issue with the Indians because yeah. the leading Indian thinkers are from generations that resent yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, 
appear in this past and we don't fully understand that so that's the first thing mm -hmm. secondly despite the fact we do have a history as a great trading nation I don't think we try with the same degree of joined up focus uh, on exporting mm. as other places mm. uh, it's particularly crucial post Brexit of course because mm. if we're going to make light work of that yeah. we've got to be better at it yeah. but we should have in my opinion uh, camps of people hanging out in Delhi okay. and in Beijing okay. working on trade deals rather than sort of grandiose generalised statements mm. that are thrown out to the media to give a flavour as to you know these great deals we're going to do when we haven't actually got people on the ground, because if you look at how the Germans are so successful, yeah. let me as an aside here, single most important economic statistic I have seen all year mm. was the release of Germany's final trade data for 2016. Guess which country is now Germany's number one overall trade partner? China. Correct. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I know. Yeah. The whole of the European Monetary Union was set up on the basis that you trade more and more with countries that yeah. were in it, yeah. Germany and France. If you combine German imports and exports, China's overtaken France and the US. And the Germans don't do that by fluke. Yeah. They've got uh, direct flights going from all over Germany mm. to all over China. Mm. That's sort of outbound into China. I know that one of your key interests was the, or is, the, the uh, creation of the Northern Power. Mm. Major passion of mine. And that's a question of attracting overseas funds to build infrastructure and to take that part of the UK to where it should be. Yeah. So while, while you were doing that, I yeah. mean, formally, I guess, yeah. uh, and you've stepped back from that a little bit now, yeah. were people listening to you in government when you talked about the need to engage and attract funding? Uh, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> I kidded myself they would do. Be, you know, for me to enter the world of politics was a bit odd, yeah, yeah. I don't really have political opinions and mm -hmm. I've always been a bit suspicious uh, of people having a role like the one I was given, yeah. uh, but nonetheless I, I did it and I thought it was because I was going to be given responsibility and an ear yeah. and it felt like it, mm. uh, linking it together with your institutes, mm. uh, I know that the Chinese in particular were very taken with the Northern Powers. It, mm. it, 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 the broad concept mm. of trying to help an area be regenerated yeah. sits very easy with the Chinese way of thinking. Uh, and we, so I, I went out there with George Osborne uh, on a big mission mm. uh, with civic leaders from the north of England. And of course, one of uh, the most enjoyable moments of my brief time in government is when we, we took President Xi to Manchester yeah. as part of uh, his, his, his trip to celebrate the so-called golden relationship. So it felt yeah. like I had an ear, particularly importantly from the yeah. investors, because you're right. Well, and as you know, there was an attempt to get the Chinese to invest in Scotland, which didn't <coughs> work out, uh, unfortunately, and I hope that we'll be able to get them come back again. But I think that they were rather disturbed by the lack of follow-through uh, politically here. So what, what, you know, what I would say, uh, and here I choose my words slightly carefully, yeah, which is not always my natural tendency, but I don't think uh, since we had the change in leadership in the UK, the focus on uh, China in particular has been as strong as it was yeah. before, yeah. and that's a shame. Yeah. I think it's partly because they don't understand it, mm. partly because they haven't had the time. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously a simple matter of Brexit to focus on, and there's mm. now an election, but mm. I hope they rediscover that soon. Yeah. Because I know from my own experience, the Chinese are very taken with the golden relationship. Yeah. And by that, they mean the UK. And that means including Scotland. Yeah. And so concerted, uh, credible approaches to them, as I think you've had some experience of as it relates to Scotland, yeah. they are very open to if they believe the British yeah. establishment is going to be supportive of yeah. it. And I, it's, it's very, very important uh, that this is rediscovered yeah, yeah. Uh, once we get our election out of the way. I want to take us in a slightly different direction to sort of begin to wrap up our conversation yeah. now, which is that, uh, as you know, one of the things we've been doing is working with universities to create university hubs. 
because we believe that by empowering the students and the faculty of the many universities in Scotland with which we work um, to take the initiative, we can build events around them by bringing people up here. Mm -hmm. But working with young people who are great believers in making and affecting change, yeah. there's an aspect of what you believe in passionately that I'd love you to talk about briefly, which is the work you've been doing on the antimicrobial resistance mm. review. I wrote it down so I could say it. <laughs> Just I, tell me about that, because that's so different from what from Gold yeah, Sachs, it's yeah, yeah. what you were unknown for. What moved you to do that, and can you just encapsulate for the people that's... Can, I, can I just say before it, that I'm glad you asked me about the young people, what, one of the reasons I accepted the invitation to come back a second time mm -hmm. is because one of the things I love yeah. uh, is speaking at events where there are young people yeah. there. Yeah. Not least because it's more likely that I think I'm going to learn something sure. from them yeah. than people that have been around as long as sure. you know. Sure. So it's, uh, it's really important. Good. Uh, and I can't help, in some ways I find the cheeky part of me is thinking, in some ways, what are you creating the, a sort of a Scottish version in universities of, of, of Chinese Confucius Institutes, ah, really, right. embedding your yes. appropriately uh, belief in this, and I think it's a fantastic thing for these young people. You. On the question you asked me about yeah. antimicrobial resistance, it abbreviates to AMR, right. which makes it easier yes. as a, in terms of a mouthful. Yep. Yep. You know, I, when I left Goldman Sachs four years ago, I had no idea what I wanted to do, uh, but I knew I wanted to not do what I'd been doing, not because I didn't like it, it's because I just wanted to do something different. Yeah. So I developed this weird criteria, if it can't be better, it's got to be different, mm -hmm. which basically meant I was saying no to everything that yeah. people approached me with. Yeah. And out of the blue, I got approached about whether I would lead this independent review into uh, 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 antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. And I thought, well, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. It sounds pretty important. So, yeah, I'll do it. And, and very importantly, in my own mind at least, it's probably been the most stimulating thing I ever did in my life. Uh, partly because it's so important at the core. It's about the growing uh, uh, dependency on the increasingly few antibiotics that work. Uh, we all think of antibiotics as being some kind of miracle sweet yeah. that we can use to solve sore throat, mm -hmm. eye infection, sure. feeling a bit tired. We've got to stop all of that. We have to stop treating these things like sweets. And our review was asked to approach it from an economic and financial perspective yeah. and to come up with uh, whatever recommendations we could mm. uh, that would make a difference to the future. Mm and in particular to be the basis of a high-level agreement at the United Nations, right. which at the time I laughed about, and everybody who asked me yeah. laughed about, but we you indeed secured it. Secured it. Yep. Uh, and that's one of the many reasons why it was the most enjoyable thing I've ever done. But it's very inspiring because also the, the consequence of not doing that is that eventually we have these uh, drug-resistant diseases which will kill people. So bringing it back uh, to young people, yep. Uh, we showed at the start of this review that if we don't do something about it, mm. uh, by 2050, I deliberately chose that year because yeah. that's the year in which the Briggs story ended up focusing on. Yeah. Uh, to, to our horror, uh, we showed that if we don't do something about the path we appear to be on, mm. there will be 10 million, that is 10 million people a year dying mm from antimicrobial resistance related illnesses. Um, kind of emphasize... A, a Many of them in Asia and Africa. Million, a million of those 10 in China, mm. a million of those 10 in India, mm. and probably both places wouldn't reach their potential. Yeah, yeah. They don't help solve this. Yeah. And as with, unfortunately, so many other things, devastate parts of Africa. So it is absolutely crucial yeah. that we find a solution to this problem. Well, Jim, I think that, that story in itself will inspire young people to have so. big ideas. And, it's their uh, future. Right? And I know a lot of people are going to look forward to hearing what you have to say this evening. And thank you again for coming up to uh, Ricky, bringing the sunshine from the, from the north, and uh, being with us again. Really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Jim.